first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you to the show. If this is the first time you're actually tuning into stories written by a current prisoner, I strongly encourage you to hit the subscribe button. If you like prison-related topics, if you like interviews directly from inside of prison from actually incarcerated inmates, directly from the source, straight from the horse's mouth, please hit that subscribe button. There was this one evening we were all sitting around the office, and uh, David called me. And he says, Martin, he goes, uh, uh, prepara todos los, todos los plebes and get them ready to go, bro. And I said, all right. I said, how do you want us to dress, right? Because we always dress in a particular fashion depending on the situation. Sometimes we would go as cops. Sometimes we go as civilians. Sometimes we go, you know what I mean? Depending on the situation, bro, you know what I mean? And, um, and so uh, this time he said, just go casual, bro. So uh, I told all the boys, get ready, get your mochilas, because we used to carry mochilas with us with extra rounds of ammunition and, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, grenades or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So everybody dressed casual. I had a button-down shirt, I had some jeans on, cowboy boots, and I had a cowboy hat on. You know what I mean? And at this time, it was just me, Pato, and David. But he told me, he goes, look, brother, he goes, look for any good butcher knife we got in the house. So I went and got the biggest butcher knife we had. And he came by, he picked up me and Pato, and uh, we rode out. And uh, we, you know, we were you know, just listening. And he's like, look, bro, where we're going right now? We're going to go take care of some business. He goes, this dude was the business partners of Ben Amin's. And uh, he, um, when Ben Amin had to go undercover after the Cardinal got killed, the dude um, uh, thought he was going to get over and rob Ben Amin for his money, you know? And uh, so he, you know, he took advantage of Benjamin for a couple few million dollars, man. So Benjamin wants us to go in. He wants us to take out the husband and the wife. And he said, but he wants us to tie everybody up in the house. Once we got everybody secured, he wanted to go through the house and get, you know, any paperwork that was business related. And anything else we thought that would show what this guy, was, how he was living, you know what I mean? So, all right, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know. So we do, bro. We go, and it's the house is walled in, bro. It's got a huge wall, like about a 15, 20-foot wall around it, you know what I mean? And on the top of the wall is barbed wire. So uh, we're looking for a way to get in. And, you know, we're trying to see, because they had big old gates, too, you know, and you couldn't just get in, the gates were locked. So finally, David finds a way to shimmy up the wall, get over the barbed wire, shimmy down inside the property, and then we were going to make our way into the house. Papa's waiting for us outside. David gets up the wall, gets over the barbed wire, and gets into the, uh, gets into the inside of the property. No matter of fact, let me back up. He was standing at the top of the wall waiting for me. And he said, my thing. So I start climbing my way up, right? And when I get to the top on the barbed wire, I'm straddling the barbed wire, ball, but it's loose. And I'm kind of like, like, you know, holding on, going back and forth, right? And David starts busting up, man, because I got that cowboy hat on. And I'm trying to keep my cowboy hat on, and I'm holding on to the barbed wire. And it looked like I was, bron- you know, rodeo bronking, you know what I mean? And he starts laughing, man. He hey, cabrón, you know what I mean? Get down from here. So I climbed down, man. He's laughing, man. He's like, bro, he goes, you look funny as hell up there. You look like a, a bronco rider, you know what I mean? And uh, so we stay quiet. We're ducked down. We're waiting for an opportunity. And they had dogs on the property, so the dogs are barking, man. And I guess the, the people got curious, so they come outside. And as soon as they exposed themselves, man, me and David came out with the guns. And we gaffled them up, took them back in the house. He told me to tie them all up. So I started tying them all up. Well, they had kids, too. They had two little boys that were twins, and they had an older daughter. So we tied them up, too, and got everybody laid out in the living room. Well, this guy, and David already told us, this guy had a brother that worked for him that he treated like shit. So, I mean, you know, the guy was a multimillionaire. 
but he treated his brother real bad, brother. You know what I mean, and uh, he uh, would dog him out, wouldn't pay him right, would treat him like shit. You know what I mean, and, and all that. So you know, David said, "Yeah, I said, well, I thought, you know, no, no, see there. You know what I mean? He was just you know going on and on about the way the guy would treat his brother." Well, while we left out the wind, and he told me about the little go to the back because it was like a little shack in the back where his brother was living with his family. He goes back, go back there and get the family and bring them up here and tie them all up. So we do, we go back there, and it was the guy and his wife, and he had like four kids. So we bring them all up here, we tie them all up. And in the meantime, David's upstairs going through the house, going through all the bedrooms and the drawers and everything he's just looking for a bunch of and he keeps sending down big bags man some of them were bags full of paperwork and some of them were heavy they had other you know, man so we take uh as, you know papa goes up there and joins them and i'm staying down there so keeping an eye downstairs keeping an eye on the on the family and i got everybody there and i got everybody secured and uh Bato's coming down the stairs with a gang of bags, bro. He got big old trash bags filled up with uh, different stuff. And then finally, David comes down and he goes, hey, take the husband up there. So I take the husband to the top side, and, uh, and David, we take him in a room, and then David tells me, what's the knife? So I pull the knives out, bro, and he just he gets busy, dog. He just starts, you know, jigging this dude, man. He's stabbing his head on, bro. And he tells me, you know, flip him over. So we flip him over and we stab him some more. And then David gives me a knife and he's saying, watch out car on. He goes, he's trying to show me where to hit the guy. So, you know, he's got me stabbing the dude. We're getting him, we're hitting him in the neck and all the vital organs. The guy dies, man. So then he tells me, go down and get the wife, you know. So sure enough, bro, I go down and get the wife and I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty pretty shitty, bro, because I know what the wife's going to go through, bro, and I'm like, oh, man, this is, you know what I mean? So I take her upstairs, and he has me put her in a room, in a different room, and you know what, bro, I'll tell you what, man, we got her in there, and David started out, we started working on her, and she did not yell or scream, you know what I mean? She did not, bro. I still don't want to think about it, but he got busy on it, and then he handed the knife to me, and he told me, go ahead, cover on the enemy. So I started hitting her, too. I started stabbing her, and, you know, she ended up dying, bro. You know what I mean? And uh, we go we go back out, and we start carrying those bags to the vehicle, our, our vehicle. And then we go back in, and uh, he said something to her brother. And then we left. Well, the next day we read in the paper, and you know the husband had been stabbed like fifty something times, and the wife had been stabbed like forty sometimes. And you know, the only thing that's going through my mind is how methodically he did that, but at the same time, you know, how much force and how much brutality he did as well. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, you had to have a lot of anger in you or a lot of hatred in you, bro, to do something like that, bro. But I, I couldn't do it, man. And even to this day, I don't think I could be that vicious and taking somebody. I'd rather just put a bullet in your head and let it be over with, man. But, yeah, that guy, uh, I've seen him kill everything from with a sledgehammer all the way to AK-47, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was rough, bro. In the midst of this, man, while you're doing that, while he hands you a knife and you're going to town, like, is there something that kind of takes over you in your mind? And, like, it's sick to say this, but do you somewhat feel some type of gratification, some type of pleasure? Do you lose yourself while you're doing this? No, I can't ever say I felt any pleasure, bro. To me, it was always a disgusting thing, bro, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't think he found any gratification in it as well. Like, you know, as I told you, but I mean, he used to carry around in his pocket. It was a little statuette of the Virgin Mary, and it was encased in glass and, and holy water. And it was uh, it had a, re- a gold casing around it, and his mother got it for him in Guadalajara. In Guadalajara at the Cathedral, at Cathedral de Guadalajara, La Virgen de Guadalajara, 
And she got it for him there, and it was blessed by uh, whoever worked at that church. And so he kept that in his pocket, bro. And I can recall one time that uh, we killed this dude, man, and um, it was pretty gruesome as well. And uh, I remember looking at turning back and seeing him, and he was down on one knee, and he was persona, his persona said, you know, he was doing the signs of the cross and praying. And I tripped out, bro, because when we got back in the car, I mean, and we drove off. I asked him, I said, hey, David, what was that all about, bro? And he goes, nah, man, I was just asking God to accept the man's soul, you know what I mean? And I go, what are you know? And I said, uh, I'm just curious, brother, because I've never seen him do that before. And he goes, I always do it, and I just don't do it in front of anybody. And then he showed me the little statuette that he had, man, in the, in the, in the, in the holy water, you know? And it kind of tripped me out, bro, because, you know, somebody that gets satisfaction or gratification out of doing something like what we were doing, but you know, you don't you know, you don't go through the process of praying for that individual afterwards, you know what I'm saying? You just do what you gotta do and then move on, bro. You know what I mean? So the man had a heart, man, you know what I mean? And I don't think he got any enjoyment out of it himself. And I know personally I didn't get any enjoyment out of it, man. It was something that was, you know, it was hard, bro. I mean, you know what I mean? It, you, know, you, you can't be human and enjoy killing somebody in such a gruesome way. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I don't think there was any any kind of enjoyment out of it for either one of us. Uh, I know I personally couldn't say that I ever got any enjoyment out of it.